Doctors Warren and, uh, and Marshall, uh, welcome for, to Stockholm, and I want to congratulate you on your prize. Thank you. Um, I know each of you have arrived on different days. You've been here a few days now, and it's not your first visit. Um, how's it been? Give us a glimpse of Stockholm this time through your eyes. <laughs> it's a strange place because it uh, does, you, you get a, getting up in the dark, and when it's daylight, it seems to be only just daylight at mm. the moment. And then when you're wandering around, suddenly you start thinking it's tea time and you realise it's only three o'clock and it's dark again. <laughs> so it's a real Swedish experience, that's all I can say. I've never had anything like it. So you've never been here during the winter time before, no. but you have visited Stockholm before? Mm, but always in the summer. Ah, and what do you usually do in Stockholm in the summer? You've been more um, than once before. Well, we usually have a conference or something, but mm. in my days off I wander around the shops and the, the seaside and... Uh, watch people doing things on Sunday. Last time I was here they were all having a fun run. I don't know what it was, but they were all running through the streets with T-shirts on. It was a great day. <laughs> and this time is your fun run for both of you. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we know that you're both sharing this award, but when did you first meet and, and how did you begin collaborating together? Tell Rob, you can tell yeah. that, Robert. <laughs> we first met in 1981. Uh, we basically began collaborating because um, I was working on these bacteria in the laboratory and, and I was bound, you know, I was sort of fenced in by the laboratory and I couldn't get to the clinical world to spread my work at all. And Barry was in the clinical work looking for some work to do. So he came down to see if he could help me. Always do. <laughs> anyway, he wanted to know what I was doing. So, um, and he was sort of vaguely interested in and agreed to send me some extra biopsies, the sort that I wanted from different patients which I hadn't been able to get before. And he became very interested and, and actually uh, the whole thing expanded to include the clinical area as well as my pathology work. And um, so, you know, with, in collaboration with Barry, the whole work expanded to an area which was big enough, I think, to produce really good results that we could publish, which I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. But when was the first, the first positive uh, development, uh, uh, the first breakthrough, breakthrough, if you will? I think the first breakthrough was when I saw them. <laughs> that's, well, something yeah, that's... that's true. Um, Robin had... Um, I, I wasn't aware of the fact that Robin had really been trying to get people interested in them for about 18 months before I turned up. And uh, I, I, I was in the stage of my career where you were supposed to do some kind of research project, and I... You know, I'm a bit cynical, but I thought most of the people doing research projects were doing pretty boring stuff. <laughs> and uh, so when I had the opportunity of investigating a possible new bacteria in the stomach, and as Robin showed it to me, it was, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't really figure out why other people were not interested because the medical book said the bacteria couldn't live in the stomach. And, and Robin spent all afternoon showing me all these cases. And quite clearly, it was the same bacteria. And these things were thriving in the stomach. So it was just a totally different thing from what you would normally expect to find. And I, and I thought then, I didn't have very monstrous ambitions or anything, but I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if Robin let me be co-author and we described a new bacterium? So I was sort of interested in trying to culture it straight away and everything. And it took off after that, didn't it? Mm. And, uh... Right. Well, I think the main thing was the big, our main study the next year. Well, actually, I had I knew Robin before that because I was in gastroenterology, and I, well, we didn't know each other, but um, I used to go to presentations where he would be showing the biopsy reports to the gastroenterologists each. Maybe it was a Thursday afternoon or something, and occasionally I remember Robin would make some comment about the fact there was bacteria on the biopsies. But of course, uh, nobody <laughs> appreciated Did you, the, the though, implications at the time? of this. Did you appreciate it at, at the time when you heard? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it, whether I uh, was there before we actually got working on the bacteria. I'm not. I'm not sure whether he'd mentioned before then. But I remember, remember after that, he used to rile the surgeons a bit because they would, you know, chop out somebody's stomach for ulcers, <laughs> and then Robin would show the biopsies and say good work, boys, you've chopped out the bacteria. <laughs> so, 
which is a bit of sarcasm, because obviously you don't treat bacteria with surgery, you treat them with antibiotics. So tell me, why is it that only you could see this bacteria and that, that it took actually having to point it out to people? Well, you know, one of the main arguments against my findings by the clinicians was that, Dr Warren, if those bacteria really are there, why haven't they been described before? And um, my, I mean, all I could say was that I didn't know why they hadn't been described before. They had, of course, actually been described before, but I didn't know that, neither did anyone else seem to know it. And uh, also, I didn't know why I hadn't seen them before, because really, once you've seen them, they're quite easy to see. So how did you first see them? I just saw them. <laughs> I mean, it's... One day they weren't there, and the next day they were Well, it's were. not that one day they weren't there, and the next day they weren't. It was just that one biopsy I was looking at, I just happened to find them. And once I started, you know, I saw some there, and I followed, I looked at the higher power to see what I was looking at, and... And then I sort of found that, we you know, with a very highest power magnification mm. on the microscope, and Christ, they actually are bacteria. I'm sure they are, you know. So I got special... I tried to convince my colleagues, and they couldn't see them, so I got a special stain done that I'd been playing around with, and uh, it showed them extremely well, so that nobody really, at least in my department, nobody mm. could argue about it. Everyone else did. <laughs> mm. But... Um, and the name, Helicobacter <coughs> pylori, is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Why is it called that? This describes the shape and the position of the... Okay. Why isn't it named after you? Don't scientists name new uh, bacteria? Maybe after people die, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I've got this rule. I don't think you should name anything after people that are still alive because, you know, what if they start being disreputable or something? <laughs> you say, oh, no, we've named it after him. What are we going to do? You'll, find, you'll have a disreputable bacteria. Well, there's, a, there's kind of a joke about that is that early on um, we found that helicobacters... Was more, were more common in people with sexually transmitted diseases. So that at one point there was this little theory that I was talking about that maybe they are sexually transmitted somehow. Mm. So, you know, if it was going to be a venereal disease, did you really want it to be named after <laughs> you? So as I say, OK, we'll, we'll call it you. Warren Bacteria. And he say, no, we call it Marshall Bacteria. So we just uh, cut our losses and called it Helicobacter. OK, after the shape and, and the... Helico, well, Helico... It used to be called Campylobacter pyloridus. Campylo means curved. It's, it's Greek, I guess, classical Greek. Campylo means curved and bacter means rod, so curved rod. But it wasn't just curved, you know, like a, like a cholera bug mm. or vibrio, as mm. we call it. Oh, the Campylobacter's either for that matter. But That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually but it's sort twisty. of double curved. Yeah. Mm. So it's like a corkscrew, and it's a very short corkscrew with one and a half turns. But other helicobacters, it's got lots of relatives now in cats and dogs especially. And they have maybe 10 turns. Uh, so the, the helical is a good explanation for it. Helicobacter. The discovery was quite some time ago now. 15, 15 well, I discovered years? them in 1979. Mm, 1979. Mm. And when did they become recognised by the scientific world? Well, really recognised as an actual cause of duodenal ulcers in 1990. Okay. That was when they were officially recognised to be treated by the general profession. And so on. They, I, mean, I think most people actually sort of recognised the existence of them and probably that that's what they did okay. quite some time before, but they didn't have an official sort of conference and decide that officially that they were you know, now textbook stuff until 1990. So this has basically been your life's work, would you say that? Well, it became so, more or less, yes. I suppose, I mean, <coughs> during that 11 years, it, uh, it was... I mean, just before that conference, I read an article in um, one of the, the most prestigious medical journals, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, mm. which basically said, I, th I think, the same things that we'd been saying in our own papers um, you know, six, and f six years before and a couple of years before our two main ones then. But um, it just practically repeated what we'd said. But I thought, you know, since it was a major American article that was saying all the things that we'd said that it would suddenly sort of end up by saying you know that they agreed with Warren and Marshall and that, that no the treatment for joining ulcers is is should now be uh, uh, include treating these bacteria <laughs> but the bloody thing ended up just the last couple of lines is saying uh, yes but of course this work is still just research work. <laughs> you know so, so what general... was your response to that isn't there isn't there a formal response that one no. can make towards it, you can bang your head against a brick wall so many <laughs> times, you know, and uh, I think you've just got to have faith that you, you know what you're talking about, because in the end, well, 
<laughs> I hope in the end it worked out. In the end you've gotten the ultimate recognition. It's come, mm. you know, just this year. Well, you found I mean, out we've... just two months ago that you were being, being uh, awarded this, this prize. Mm. But how has, how has it affected your, your lives since then, both personally and, and professionally? What, the prize? Or what the life? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the recognition through the prize. Well, the main thing that's affected... I, I retired eight years ago, actually. I, I'm, you know, I'm a, a retired gentleman these days. At least I was. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, just doing my own thing and enjoying myself. And now suddenly I've been swamped by everybody around the world wanting me to do things for them. And uh, I finally just decided to take Barry Marshall's um, um, <coughs> offer and um, hand it over my the major part of this sort of thing to a, a university secretary that they've appointed to look after us. Uh -huh. Otherwise, I'd, you know, I'm just not any good at that sort of thing anyway, at the best of times. So she'll fix, I hope she'll sort of sort all the, the things out and just let us know the important things that we have to do. Mm. And what about you, Dr. Marshall? Um, I had a, I think I was working at approximately two jobs and now I've got three. <laughs> so, What's the third one? Well, the third one's the Nobel. The first one was the academic, the second one was business commercial things, and then now the third one's Nobel. So Robin is, is right. The University of Western Australia has uh, supported us and have funded uh, a lady who's going to be the Nobel secretary. Mm. And when, when someone... Are, typically, it's impractical. Someone asks you to give a lecture in say it's uh, Thailand mm. and you would say okay well it takes me a day to get to Thailand a day to give the lecture and a day to get back mm. and so you would allocate three days of your time to do it but then in fact it takes you four days to write the lecture and nothing gets done while you're away so it takes you two or three days just to catch up with your mail mm. plus your dog tired so you really can't do an international lecture in, in three days it really takes you at least a week of, of you know, lost time, you have hard work. And um, so that uh, by having a Nobel manager, she can allocate our time and say, well, you can't go there because you've got this and this activity on each end of it. And if you want to kill yourself, that, uh, that would be a way to get there pretty quickly is trying to do too many of these lectures. Um, I mean, the many, many of them are quite important lectures, but you just can't do everything. And it's better to have somebody else making the, these decisions for us because... We would try to accept everything, and in the end, we would I don't know, burn out or something. We'd get sick of it. But I think done properly, we, I think we can enjoy it at the moment. Mm. It's a, it's, you know, I think we're coping with it fairly well at this stage. Now that we've been well, in the we yet to find out what happened. I don't know how you've been doing it, but actually, most of these requests to go and give lectures, I've just been, email, they've mainly come by email. Mm. And I've just been emailing them back, telling them to get in touch with me next year. So suddenly, next year probably, this is all going to start again. Mm. <laughs> and I'm going to get all these bloody emails. But at least now I can forward the emails to, to our secretary at the university and she can decide what... I think that's, she's good at this sort of thing. I think she can go into them, work out which ones are really important and which ones we should do and which ones we can do if we want to and which ones we can forget about and send nice letters to the whole lot. <laughs> It might be a blessing in disguise then that you already retired when 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 the when the prize came about. I wondered. I don't uh, need to do it, actually. Don't worry. I mean, <laughs> when I say retired, I've retired from from ordinary work, but I've started. I've been able to do some of the things I've wanted to do for many years. Tell me a little bit about those things. Well, I started off by trying to catch up with my hobbies, photography, and I've got a whole backlog of stuff at home that I haven't been able to to keep up with, and 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 I've been getting. Um, back on getting used to uh, computer work and so on as well, using computers I used to be quite good at, but I've let it lapse a bit in the last 10 years or so. Mm. Um, because these days the computer f uh, photography is so good and uh, digital photography and computer programs and printing and this sort of... So I thought maybe I can get my old pictures and scan them into the, the, comp the computer mm. and and make, do my own prints again. I used to do all my own printing when I was you know, using black and white. Mm. Um, but career-wise, do you think it would have made a difference to you in terms of sheer motivation, in terms of funding perhaps, if, you've got, if you'd gotten the Nobel Prize a little bit earlier in your career? 
Well, it would have had to have been eight years ago, earlier than that. That would have been marvellous in the fact because my, my, my wife was still alive then and she was... She actually thought I'd get it, you know. She kept telling me. <laughs> One of the last things she told me before, we, before she died was that, you know, you make sure you get, my, you know, when you get the Nobel Prize, Dr. You know, Robin, you know, <laughs> I've forgotten what she said. But, uh, yeah, she, she was right behind us. She, she was one person who was right behind us all the time. And when she died, I, that's when I retired, actually. I just, you know, I'd been looking after her for a few months and I just thought, well, what the hell, why I go back again? But, I mean, I didn't do the photography for very long, but that's something, one of the things I'd really like to do, because after that I suddenly decided several people were at me from different places to get all my old work together and, and um, get that in a form that could be put in libraries and so on, and, you know, digitise all, you know, all my old pictures and so on, and papers and, and all, you know, all the work that I'd done before. And that, I thought, you know, all right, I'll just... <laughs> scan a few things into the computer, it won't take very long. <sighs> that, that was the silliest mistake I ever made. Because <laughs> I think someone kept telling me that I'm a perfectionist. And, well, a lot of people have told me that, but I fiddle around with things and, and I don't like getting on to the next thing until the last thing is done perfectly. And that what I find is that as I get better and better at doing it, all the times I did it before are no longer good enough, so I have to go back and do those again. And actually, I just got to the stage where I was doing these old papers and pictures and so on, and illustrations and everything else from my old, from all my old work. And there's a hell of a lot of stuff there. Um, and uh, this came up, and now <laughs> all that's been <laughs> left behind somewhere. And I, you know, when I get the time, I'm going to have to start all over again on that. And um, because you've really got to keep at it, mm. you know, you, to keep the, you know, all the different things in the computer, the illustrations and and. Um, uh, um, type recognition mm. programs and for scanning you know, text and so on. I mean, it's all very tricky and, mm. <laughs> and, and you can't do it fast unless you've really got it at your fingertips and, and you've got to be, at least I've got to be doing it all the time to, to be in that position. And you mm. want to be thorough about it as well? Well, I can't help it. I, I am thorough at that sort of thing. If it's not right, it's not good enough. And I <laughs> Understandable. Mm. And uh, Dr. Marshall, your family's reaction, close friends, were there any surprising, you expect people to say congratulations and be really happy for you? My family's re reaction was to drink a lot of alcohol <laughs> as quick as possible. <laughs> they sound quite Swedish, actually. <laughs> yeah. School. Yes, they <laughs> can do that. They fit right in. So the first night, Robin and I were um, doing interviews for several hours, and as we as the, the evening went on, this noisy party got louder and louder just behind us. And in the end, I had to drive everyone home. They, they weren't sober enough to drive their home cars home. We were the only two that hadn't had anything to drink. <laughs> or maybe just one. Oh, well. Turns out that we, we, you can't be having a hangover every second day if you've won the Nobel Prize. There's stuff to do next morning, unfortunately. But you did have your own private celebration at some point where you... Yeah, well, we actually we had a, some pretty good uh, little parties, you know, just a, the relatives around. So my parents, Adrian's parents, are still alive, and the the kids. Uh, so, and then there were some big parties at the government house ballroom and for Western yeah. Australia and the university. Some of them were quite good. Some yeah. of them were just politicians, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but we, I think. Uh, I appreciate that uh, everybody wishes us the best and actually we have been doing this research for 20 years so literally thousands of people have been experimented on during that time in Western Australia mm. particularly and uh, so they all, all have helped us in different ways and they all are all having a great time coming to these parties and slapping us on the back. I mean. I, uh, Robin, you, you might uh, remember, do you remember uh, Dot Hayes that was the gastroenterology nurse in, with, mm. well, um, the nurse that was doing gastroenterology with us in, in Royal Perth in 1982, really, Dot Hayes her name was, she was doing ceramics at the time, a ceramics course, and she baked this little plate with a picture of Helicobacter pylori on it, and she had written around the edge of it, the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so she was the first one that decided that it was worth the Nobel Prize, years before we heard it from anybody else, I think. Or there was going to happen indeed. Well, and she was, was probably a fortune teller. She knew teller. it was important, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you pointed out that you know while while most sufferers in in first world countries have basically been cured and you don't you you're getting a prevalence in in third world countries is this the, to do with ac simply accessibility accessibility to to medication for well there's more of it in developing countries because the the hygiene is not up to 20th century standard in a lot of countries and uh, you can't do much about H. pylori uh, if everybody is poor and they don't have a clean water supply. So, you know, there's really nothing you can do at the moment in Peru because if you treat people for their H. pylori, there's a 30% chance they'll catch it back again just by drinking the water. So it means that you would only treat the really serious ulcer patients and you'd have to keep an eye on them because quite a few of them would get it back. Okay, so alleviation has to start with proper clean water supply. Mm, it's waste. not totally understood how you catch it at, as well. So uh, I would say that there's plenty, plenty of uh, fruitful research projects in countries uh, where the helicobacter varies in different ways. Malaysia is an interesting one mm. because the different racial groups, uh, the Muslims have a rather low prevalence of H. pylori, the Chinese are much more. And so that you would look at diet, ethnic things, um, different customs, different hygiene practices in their families, and you might have some clues as to what keeps Helicobacter away. Is this anything that you're working on at the moment or, or will be involved in? Uh, well, we have done a bit of this work. Um, we've uh, recently done a survey in indi indigenous communities in Australia where there's quite high levels of Helicobacter, but we think it's just a developing country issue. But in a, in a specific person, it's hard to identify exactly what caused them to catch it. I mean, Robin's got his own personal story there. Do you want to share hmm? this one? Well, you used to have H. pylori, yeah. didn't you? But do you think you ever remember when you caught it? Or, no. You know, you, well, you I mean, I think the work that Dick B. Callan did just shows pretty conclusively that people probably had it from childhood. That's right. So you were a kid in uh, Adelaide or somewhere. Yeah. So... But about, I mean, in Australia, about a third of the population's got it. Mm. And um, I don't know if that third, a lot of them, you know, I mean, what percentage do you reckon? 1% gets peptic ulcer disease? Oh, I reckon 20% uh, get peptic ulcer in their lifetime. And that would, that would translate into a lifetime in the whole, uh, incidence in the whole population of 10%. So that, that was the number that people used to quote. So it must be about 20% chance of having an ulcer if you have H. pylori. Okay. But, but, um, <coughs> so if we go back to your situation, Robin, you lived in the city. Mm. Your dad was a professional person. Yeah, well, well, yeah, winemaker. Well, oh, <laughs> cool winemaker. Cool. And, and, yeah. and did you have like masses of brothers and sisters? Uh, I had a couple of younger ones. Yeah, so you didn't really have any reason to have helicobacter, except in those days things were not particularly clean. People didn't know. Well, did no, you I always think they have were a, clean, actually. Did we you have a flushing toilet, or did yeah. you ever live in the house with... No, I think it was just as clean then as it was uh, a generation later. So you might have caught it... What about your dad? Did he have ulcers, or anyone in your family have ulcers? Or anything? I wouldn't be surprised if the old man did have them. He behaved like it sometimes, <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah. So it's hard to track it down, but obviously... In a Western country, you'd have to catch it off someone in your family. And possibly you can catch it from your partner, your spouse. But even, you know, it's not horribly infectious, so you wouldn't catch it in the first... Well, from my own experience of families, the people who uh, put the funniest things in their mouths are the you know, one-year-olds and two-year-olds. Yeah, they crawl around on the floor and just about eat anything. And I think one, the best theory I could think of is that it's got something to do with that. And if there's... He'll go back to being able, you know, I mean, they get sort of fecal material in their nappies and so on. I mean, it all goes into everybody else's mouths at some stage. And so clearly there's a, there's, there is, there's a lot more research to be done in well, terms yeah, of causes of the disease. If you say it's fecal oral, well, obviously little toddlers can't, you know, don't have the level of hygiene. If you've got three little children together in the same room, well, if one vomits, they all experience a bit of vomitus in but, the environment. If we could move on to, to something else, I've noticed that Australia seems to have bred a number of uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners in just medicine and, or <coughs> physiology. You seem to be overweight in that field of Nobel Prize win, winners than any other field. Do, do you think there's anything special behind this? Is there a specially nurturing environment in this field? <coughs> in, um... I'd like to say so, but I don't know. You don't? I mean, actually, I know... 
Um, Flory, for instance, went to the same school, and medical school as I did, never mind the same country. And um, there was another Nobel Prize winner that went to them too. I can't remember his name, Clegg or William Clegg? Physics. Um, got a physics prize back in the early 1900s. Bragg, Bragg. Bragg, Bragg that's right. So, that's I mean, that's three of us just from one, from one school. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but there's only one school in Adelaide, isn't there? <laughs> well, people that went to that school say so, yeah. And then, and then the same university, although, you know, I mean, Flora and myself went to the same medical school, never mind the university. So, But, I mean, coming back to the, the issue of education, how, how strong of a role do you think it plays in shaping people with the Constitution to, to face the sheer number of frustrations that you, for example, have faced over the years? Uh, in, in research? I mean, do, do you think that, well, what do you think is about education that, that fosters scientists and, and their determination to succeed? Well, I think in my case it's just my nature. I'm, if people try and push me, I'd probably push back <laughs> if I think I'm right. Well, I think, Robin, um, I mean, if you think you're right and someone tells you you're wrong, you say, well, he wouldn't know what he's talking about, I'm right, you know. There's, I, I suppose there are people who are quite influenced by what other people think of them or say about them. And uh, maybe Robin and I are not like that. I mean, we, don't, we don't care if you, know, you, you think what we're doing is dumb. We, if we think it's interesting, we'll say, well, you know, it doesn't really make any difference to us what someone else thinks. And, of course, once we got into it, we, were, we knew that we were the ultimate experts in this particular area of gastric research, if you like. Nobody was doing the same work and obviously we knew much more about it than anybody. So once it started, you, it was irrelevant that, if, that other people said that we didn't, they didn't think these bacteria caused ulcers because they didn't know as much about them as we did. So. I think one of the things about it was that we had very good evidence that what we were doing was, was correct. Um, I've had people come along and ask me about, you know, when do we sort of encourage people to, with new ideas to, and um, well, I think you can encourage people with new ideas all the time, but one thing they should have is some sort of evidence to back up their ideas. And I mean, even with the extremely good evidence, I could just show you a picture and say, there are the bacteria, there's the mucosa, that's what they're doing, you know. Um, so that you could see, that anyone here, could, anybody could see that um, it's black and white. It's, you know, there's, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> Um, but even in that case, I still had half my colleagues trying to prove that the bacteria weren't even there. Mm. You know, but but I mean, I, w I wouldn't have argued so much if I hadn't had some way of arguing to, with people. But I could show them the things. You know, I could project slides on the wall and say, "Look, there are the bacteria on them. You know, there's the information underneath." <laughs> well, one of the other arguments they had was that, uh, and this, I mean, I managed. We managed to prove this was wrong later on, but. But that um, you know, Dr. Warren, the, um, the bacteria are probably just secondary to the inflammation. And but I didn't think they were. And the way the bacteria were arranged on the surface of the the mucosa and so on looked as if they were causing the inflammation. But uh, you can't really argue like that. You've got to get some better evidence. And this is where, for me, it was very good that Barry came in and helped me because he could get the the extra evidence. He could see the patients and, and so on. He knew, knew what was going on with the patients that I didn't. I mean, I think in, in, in certain circumstances, a lot of students of, of science, probably molecular, molecular biology or microbiology, would, would say you've been lucky, you know, that, that you've had your findings and confirmed mm. to yourselves pretty early. But what about the sheer frustration of doing uh, experiment after experiment? I mean, what would you advise young students in the sciences? How, how would you advise them to, to, to go on? What should, they, what should be the key? What should they be aiming for eventually? I think it depends what they're doing. And, but I think they should be aiming at getting some good evidence for their ideas. Um, and uh, that's not always so easy. I mean, with the, the luck that we had was the luck in finding something that there was pretty, I mean, we pretty easily found pretty good evidence for. So I, you know, anyone who really was interested and wanted to, to, to look, you know, only had to look. Mm. But most people didn't want to look. We, we, we were doing, I mean, I was trying to convince people that something was there that everyone knew wasn't there. It wasn't like um, a slight change or an improvement on something, you know, or a variation or, you know, I mean, 
there are very few bacteria appear in the small intestine that do anything much, but people are always wanting to find an organism that's causing some, some disease in the small intestine. And, and they're, you know, they're always asking, you know, a giardia there, you know, it's a type of protozoan. And we used to see it about, you know, once every two or three years. Mm. But the, the gastroenterologists would ask us at every damn biopsy from the small bowel, you know, are there giardia there? <laughs> and, and uh, <coughs> I mean, if we found something else there, but, um, you know, if we had, um, and sort of managed to show that whatever else we found there was causing the symptoms that patients were having, they'd be only too pleased to, to hear about it. Mm. But for, to find these in the stomach like that, when bacteria just simply were not supposed to be in the stomach, mm. it was a total change. It was, um, and one of the ways I put it sometimes is that, uh, you know, everybody knows that the earth is flat. And the fact, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that if you look over there, you can't see a mountain that's just over the horizon over there. It's because it's because the earth isn't flat. Mm. It goes around. You know, oh, well, maybe the, the light's curved. <laughs> so there's a process of constantly <coughs> learning and being open to, to, yeah. to challenges. But it's, it's a complete change from being the earth being flat to you being someone saying that the earth is round. And, you know, I mean, what the hell are you talking about? The earth can't be round. We'd walk around here and fall. You know, we'd, <laughs> I mean, but, and going around the sun, you know, what, what do you mean going around the sun? We're floating around in midair. <laughs> we're not, you know, we're standing on the ground. It's this sort of thing, you know, and uh, you've got to be able to look at things from further away and see the big picture, I suppose. It's a bit like a religion. And uh, as the years went by, I think we both realised that it was, no, the process wasn't going to happen if we fought harder or argued more. It was just time that was going to solve all our uh, problems, arguing and being controversial and everything. And uh, it took 10 years so that when we started off, the people who were the senior professors who were criticising our work or being conservative about it, they had then started to retire and the, the hot uh, young guns uh, of our age were now the professors and they had all kind of grown up a little bit with a bit of exposure to Helicobacter and had played around with it and so that by, 19, in the, by the 90s mm. uh, it was easy to find lots of professors who were find, doing the same thing and who agreed so that the, the controversy kind of aged and, and fizzled out. There were still little aspects of it, but there was, by the 90s, there was not this argument of whether helicobacters existed or whether most people had them or whether they were harmful. Those things were out of the way. The, the, the things were argued, and you know, should you treat people with this antibiotic or that antibiotic rather than whether you should treat them at all. That wasn't on the agenda anymore. Uh, have any of the non-believers come forward and actually shake, shake your, shaken your hand and yeah, said, well done? Yeah, well, that, that really happened a few years ago, didn't it, Robin? Yeah, I've had a number of them do it. I've, I've actually heard people come out, come out of the woodwork in the last few months actually who have said that got rather guiltily that they, <laughs> they were sort of uh, naysaying behind our backs. <laughs> Well, never mind the drug companies. I've had a number of surgeons come yeah. along and you know tell me that you know <laughs> that work you did. It's really it really took away a lot of our business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a killer industry, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. Not just the drug. In, I mean, the drug companies didn't like us much either because mm. they were they had actually produced some really good drugs mm. for peptic ulcer disease. The main trouble with them was that they didn't actually cure the disease. They just um, relieved it. So that the ulcers could heal, and then they'd take the drugs away, and the patients that were all right for a few weeks, and then the bad, this is the really bad patients, and they get it again. And so, in effect, actually, these patients weren't really much better off than they had been, even though they could take the drugs and relieve it. They were sort of permanently taking drugs. They couldn't eat food they wanted to, and they were getting re repeated attacks of pain. And I mean, I've had patients writing, of this type writing letters to me, and they, as far as they were concerned, they didn't seem to be any better off than they had been. Even though they had these really good drugs that, mm. while they were taking them, they actually could heal and relieve the, the, the disease. And um, actually, this is, I think, what put the surgeons out of business. Mm. I don't think we did. <laughs> well, well that's, that, that's probably one, one good reason to, st to stay within research instead of working for a commercial drug company, which is a a question that a number of our science students in Sweden face today. There's a dilemma, a dilemma of wanting to work, you know, should I go work for a drug company or should I go work for work in research, stay in academia? 
um, and especially as Sweden is trying to grow this biotechnology sector at the moment with the number of drug development companies. There's so much money needed for this sort of thing that I think you've got to have a bit of both. Yeah, it's good to have both. And I think the United States have got both. Mm. I think Sweden, you have got both. Uh, but in Australia, it's, there's a bit of a scarcity of commercial uh, biotech mm. people who are actually in the business who employ scientists. Mm. Uh, and so that it just worries you that there are good scientists coming out of the university with degrees. And apart from teaching students, there's not really a job for them at the end of it. Mm. And so they're all going to the four corners of the earth. This is what generally happens then to Australian mm. scientists. That's right. They, but they have to follow the money. And the money right now, well, take one area of stem cell research. It's all in California. Mm. They just funded $3 billion of stem cell work over the next three years out of private subscriptions. So obviously if you're in stem cell research, you'd be looking at the wanted ads from California. And so that's what will happen. We unfortunately have come to the end of our time, so I'm going to have to say thank you so much for being here. It was lovely meeting the both of you. Good luck with the rest of the week. I know it's going to be exhausting for the two of you. I, I hope there's some enjoyment in it uh, for your families and the rest of the entourage that you've brought with you. It's great to meet you. It's been lovely to meet you. <laughs> Thank you.